You are listening to Prescription Fierce. Fierce is defined as a heartfelt and powerful intensity. This is what we hope to ignite in each of you as your source of inspirational stories from medicine, surgery, and science interwoven with self-coaching content. Here we talk about our joys, successes, and struggles, and how to move through life with more purpose and ease. We are excited to share this journey with you. Welcome to Prescription Fierce with your hosts, Jennifer Vilwalk and Aaron Fawcett. So today we are lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Sarah Bo. Dr. Bo is a phenomenal military surgeon who has served her country both domestically as well as on deployments overseas. She is a fellowship-trained pediatric otolaryngologist currently practicing in Texas and brings a wealth of knowledge and experience within the realms of quality improvement, pediatric ENT, residency selection, and personality as it pertains to surgical training. We hope that you will find this interview both enjoyable and educational. Well, welcome everybody who is listening today. Um, today, we are lucky enough to have Dr. Sarah Bow with us. And so for those of you who have not met her before, she's an outstanding pediatric otolaryngologist, and she practices within the military health system down in San Antonio, Texas. She did her residency at Ohio State and then did her fellowship training in pediatric ENT, as I mentioned. She has a wealth of different things that she's involved in from the peer review process to a variety of different committees at the academy and the national level. But Sarah, I'm curious if there are any accomplishments that don't find their way onto your CV, but that you're proud of and would like to highlight now as well. Well, I I think I would probably have to say having my three children and trying to coordinate their schedules in the midst of all of this. So certainly family is very important to me. Uh, and I think finding that balance is something that we're always kind of up against. So trying to integrate that as opposed to, to that balance piece is I think a, a big component of what I, what I try to do. So I have three kids. They are about to be 11, nine, and six, and it is starting to be activity time. And so there's soccer or gymnastics or swimming or some birthday party. So there's a lot that comes with that, but I, uh, I tr- try to make myself be able to be present for many of those things as well, because uh, in the end, I think that's what matters most to me. So it's very important. Absolutely. And I feel like I remember that you have chickens as well. Was that a new COVID experiment? Are they still alive? Uh, Wow. You know, the chickens has actually been um, a little bit of, I would say, a war um, of the chickens versus the wildlife in our neighborhood. And so we have actually gone through um, many iterations of different Uh, groups of chickens. So at the moment, we actually have some adult chickens and some adolescent chickens and some toddlers and some infants. And so uh, it's kind of a rotating cycle that we have, but it's been uh, it's been an entertaining thing to do and certainly uh, was very helpful through COVID. Uh, We actually our neighbors were all coming over during the times of the egg shortages. And so we were supplying the free range eggs for the entire neighborhood. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Well, rather than chickens, although I someday would hope to have some in my backyard as well, we're going to talk a little bit about your path to medicine and and what it looks like to be not only a mom in medicine, but a surgeon and a military surgeon at that. And so I was hoping that you could kind of bring us, I guess, to the beginning and walk us through a little bit about what your path has looked like. Yeah. So uh, to some extent, I consider myself fairly lucky that I had was able to do a fairly straightforward path in a way. I went actually kind of right from college into medical school, into residency, and then into practice for a little bit before doing fellowship. So uh, that is one thing that tends to be um, fairly common in the military is that many of us usually go into practice for a period of time. And that is because there's only so many fellowship trained positions in the military at a given point in time. Um, And so if you have a particular interest, um, if it's not available, then you kind of just have to wait and see. So um, I was fairly certain when I decided upon ENT, although that was actually a, a late decision, I 
thought I was going to be a pediatrician basically all the way up through my third year of medical school. And then fortuitously rotated on ENT. And I think it took about, I don't know, four hours in a neck dissection case for me to be like, this anatomy is amazing. These people are wonderful. This is what I want to do. And then had to change my entire fourth year schedule around very last minute. So, um, but very happy to say that obviously I got to match in ENT. And so then went on through residency, as I said, and then um, ended up also being pretty lucky uh, to come down to San Antonio um, in the residency program here in the Air Force, which is what I'm in. Um, we only have one residency uh, nationally. So um, I have always had an interest in education. They actually hadn't really had a generalist to join them from a residency perspective, uh, but I reached out to the program kind of early on saying, you know, I'd really like to come down there and be involved uh, from an education standpoint. And so I uh, was pretty lucky to be able to come down here um, when I actually first finished residency training. Um, and so then uh, I did three years as a general ENT uh, before a pediatric otolaryngology spot opened up. So I found my way back to pediatrics in, in some sense. Uh, and so did my fellowship training and then uh, was able to come back after that as a, as a fellowship trained staff for the same residency program. And so it sounds like part of your path has involved not only knowing what you want, but being able to pivot and be patient. Any other main lessons or things that you've learned along your journey that you think would be helpful for others to cultivate as well? Yeah, I, you know, I definitely, as you say that, I think I have dabbled in some ways in many things along the path and some have worked out and some have not worked out, but I think that each of them has been, uh, I've taken kind of lessons learned from them. And so certainly you may do something which you realize, okay, well, that may not end up kind of working out in this system or in this way. And so, uh, but it, it can give you a lot of kind of learning points that you can take forward in, into other positions. So, um, you know, when I was a general ENT and came down here, they actually kind of in your up your alley, basically, they had a sublingual immunotherapy program. And I was like, this is great. We need to do more of this. We need to like have more patients and get this more organized. And I essentially became like the director of the sublingual immunotherapy program. And we were getting outcome measures. It was fantastic. And then it relies on having some money to do it because of our system. We don't actually kind of, you know, charge patients in certain ways or kind of work with insurances and those pieces. And so for the most part, we were, we were funding a lot of that kind of out of our clinic. Um, and then, you know, budgets change and things come down from higher up. Um, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, we can't really do this anymore. And then I essentially was heading to fellowship and, then it essentially almost kind of like died behind me. So I, I think one of the one of the things that I definitely learned from that is you can put a lot of a lot of passion and effort into a project, um, but if you are or if you're the only one that is really passionate and willing to put the effort in for it, um, it may not last when you when you finish that piece. So um, so I you know I enjoyed that um, and that was kind of a a segment of my life. Um, but then did not kind of carry forward uh, much at this point. And we still, especially with kind of COVID and just lots of other things, um, that program um, hasn't really been able to kind of get back to where it was. Um, and another thing, which I did some work as a, our director of surgical simulation uh, at our institution, and that was wonderful. It actually brought me to meet a lot of people through the, through the academy and simulation through the academy and kind of open up some um, relationships and friendships from that perspective. And, uh, and I did that just before going off to fellowship. And so that was a great experience. I learned a lot of actually educational principles, um, while I was doing that, uh, that program too, um, and then transitioned that off to somebody that was very interested in, and has actually even continued to grow that program even more. Um, and so I think, um, you definitely don't have to do things forever. Um, and you don't have to think that they're going to last forever. And, a lot of them don't. I think we'll all probably in some ways have, you know, many handfuls of roles and, and one of them may lead, you know, just taking on a role and, and gaining that experience 
it may definitely not be something that you do forever, but it may open up other pathways that then take you on to the next stage. And so I've had a number of those along the path. So, yeah. And I think that that's great advice because a lot of times we may look to those that are a little bit farther ahead of us in terms of the career path. And it seems like their path has been very linear, you know, like, like, Oh, it's just obvious you did a, and then B and then, you know, CD and so on and so forth down the alphabet. But I think for a lot of folks, especially if you have a lot of interest, that's not necessarily how the journey unfolds. And I think you're exactly right that you have to be willing to say yes, but you also have to be willing to, you know, take a step back or say goodbye to things that are no longer a good fit for you. And you mentioned some of the work that you started doing prior to fellowship in simulation and getting more involved at the national level with that. I'm assuming that this overlaps with some of the quality improvement work that you um, do as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah. So, so again, it's interesting because when you, uh, when you finish residency and you show up as new faculty, uh, certainly a lot of people are like, do you want to do this? Um, and so that is what happened to me when I first came down to San Antonio. It was like, you know, do you want to, do you want to take over the quips program? And I was like, sure. And then I was like, what actually does quips stand for? Uh, because I didn't actually <laughs> even really know. And it was quality improvement, patient safety. Um, and, and I think some of that is interesting in the sense that kind of those words and terms and direct focus um, have really expanded a lot over the past say decade or so. And so certainly even when I started my own residency training, we didn't quite have as much, you know, dedication to those kind of terms and formal understanding of what quality improvement and patient safety was um, in, in my residency training. But um, as some of the accreditation boards and everything relating to residency really picked up on it, um, then certainly it's something that is a, is a big focus um, in residency training now is understanding those principles. So I so that piece actually even came a little bit before my that my simulation work was actually taking over the quality improvement and patient safety uh, for our residency program. Um, and so, you know, certainly simulation um, has a lot of benefits in terms of being able to do aspects like deliberate practice and being able to do team-based work um, in a setting where it's much more low stakes um, than actually when it's happening um, kind of in, in real time, essentially. And so uh, there was definitely a lot of overlap in the principles and some of the basic um, understanding of, of how those go. And so um, also when it came to the education piece, like understanding debriefing and being able to kind of go through and reflect back on, on processes and how things have, have, have gone before. Um, again, there's a lot of overlap in those principles between kind of quality improvement and, and simulation and what it can provide. So. Do you think that the military in general is a little bit more open, you know, to the, the type of you know, deliberate practice and things that you're mentioning, because that, that seems to be a common theme in a lot of just the general military training to, whereas I think some of the rest of us were like, oh, a simulation, you know, and you get the eye roll and, you know, what can you really gain from this sort of artificial environment? Yeah, I, de you know, I definitely think that, um, so oftentimes we talk a little bit about how we kind of have like the medical side and sort of the line side or basically kind of more, more the true like military side of things. And definitely when it comes to um, a lot of that, that training in those pieces, simulation is kind of very foundational to some of that work. You know, certainly we've got flight simulators and a lot of, you know, being able to practice and do things before you actually do them for the first time. So I think that, 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 um, that lineage was there probably even before, you know, some of us kind of bringing out the aspects of medical simulation as well. Um, and, you know, I think in some ways there's a number of things that actually it's interesting as I learn more about the military, I'll find out that again, aspects of whether it be like augmented reality or some of these different kind of newer technologies that we're, we're looking at in medicine um, have had roots in kind of the military and that other side in terms of um, some of those kind of tactics and capabilities, but um, where we're understanding more how they potentially can be beneficial to us um, in medicine as well. 
Are there any other things that you've learned more along on the military side of things that, you know, as you look at those of us in civilian practice, you're just like, ah, you guys should really be, you know, doing X, Y, Z thing that happens all the time in military medicine, but seems very, very foreign for civilians. Well, you know, I, I think it's interesting because I think that, um, again, in, in military medicine, we are to some extent similar to, to medicine. There are definitely things that, um, exist again, kind of on the other side or out in the business world that, um, you know, we kind of take some of those principles, um, and bring them back, you know, certainly from, from our standpoint, we know that a lot of our team-based training, um, and especially kind of in the operating room, um, many of that kind of has origins in, uh, in air, like the airline industry or like from pilots. And so kind of that crew resource management checklists, all of those aspects. So again, those are kind of very much present um, in our kind of culture um, within the military. Uh, but, I, you know, I think that while those principles are there, we still potentially have some of the same struggles of, you know, keeping, keeping that culture and, really embedding it, especially as we have um, people kind of come in and out of our organization because we are a very kind of mobile force. And so people get moved around a lot. And so um, we're constantly trying to kind of recreate teams, essentially. And sometimes those principles are what we have to fall back on when we do have a lot of kind of ins and outs of the the populations that we work in because we do kind of move about to the different systems. So I think some of those aspects of kind of quality and safety are even more critical when, when you have people kind of moving about more regularly than in some other institutions that, um, where individuals work together, you know, a lot more consistently and regularly. So it kind of sounds like the, the take home there is to have, have some sort of framework or have some way that, you know, you do things routinely, especially if you have people kind of floating around or floating through in ways that are unpredictable. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one of the things that it gets back to and, and, I will fully admit, I think sometimes like my residents and people around me might get a little annoyed because I tend to over communicate, but in some ways I almost feel like you can't over communicate uh, because if anyone is trying to like read your brain, they're probably going to be wrong. <laughs> we can't, <laughs> we can't really ever get inside someone's brain as much as we think we might be able to know what they're saying. So I tend to like verbally express almost everything that I'm saying or I'm not saying, but verbally express everything that I'm thinking because it's the only way people are going to know really what's going on around me. So, um, so I think that, uh, that's something that I've just kind of learned again. It's, you know, when people are making assumptions that somebody knows something, that's when, when you can miss things. Um, and so I value a lot of uh, the principles of really just kind of closed loop communication and making sure that people are understanding what you've said, or you're understanding what they've said and really um, trying to open those lines of communication as much as possible. Uh, and I think that, that that helps because especially when you're not used to potentially working um, with an individual, then it's even harder to potentially have that understanding. So, um, so I think that that's something that I've just kind of learned over time too, is that you almost <laughs> can't say stuff enough uh, for people to be able to kind of process what's going on. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And that segues really nicely into one of the other things I wanted to talk about. You know, you and I have been co-authors on a couple of manuscripts investigating personality and how we're similar and also how we're different and what that means for uh, medical education and the way that we teach and train. And for me, you know, the COVID pandemic has really highlighted some of my kind of default behavioral programming. Like I love, I hate icebreakers. I love just getting down to business. And so I've really enjoyed meetings with our stats people where we've never met, but as soon as the meeting starts on zoom, they're like, all right, what are the variables? What's this, this, and this, like, there's no, none of the fluffy stuff, which works really well for me, but does not work really well for other people. Other people might perceive that to be rude, um, et cetera. So I'd love to hear, you know, from your perspective, what are some of the take homes of the work that we've done in personality and why, why should people other than us who have written the papers and done the work, why should others care about um, our findings? 
Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the, I think one of our more recent papers, um, which was interesting, it was looking at gender. Of course, it generally was like male, female, because that's the way that it generally is reported. And so I can't specifically speak to the fact that we didn't really look into kind of gender diverse or, or other, um, other potential gender identities, because there isn't that much in, in the way that the specific data that we looked at, it wasn't kind of recorded in that way for us to be able to do it. But um, I do think that one of the aspects that, you know, is really interesting is certainly there isn't one, like one gender does not specifically lean one way in terms of personality, that there's just as much diversity within a given gender as there is across genders. Um, and so, um, you know, I, tend to be kind of fascinated in terms of gender stereotypes because really in many ways we've just made these be over time. Um, certainly the stereotypes are there because of kind of historical background of certain kind of positions or jobs or various kind of behavioral tendencies, but really none of those are innate in any way. And so I think that that's one thing that, um, you know, was interesting to kind of look at and, and pause it because certainly the um, the, the beliefs in the background of thinking that the personality, those personalities are different in that way is there. And that's what substantiates it as opposed to when you look at it big picture and see it there saying, oh, well, there's just as much variation as we look at this. And so, you know, why do we believe that it's leaning one way or the other when there's actually that much diversity that's out there? So. Yeah, and I think that it's, you know, part of what has always struck me about the work that we've done looking at, you know, people's baseline tendencies, as well as things that emerge under stress, etc, is that a lot of these factors are important for everyone involved to know, but I think certainly for a little bit of that personal insight so that you can try and co help coach yourself or be aware of the things that are occurring within you to be the most productive. You know, whether you're a man or a woman um, who is pursuing this path, it's important to have those insights more so than it is to try and force people into little boxes of what are preconceived notions of how they're supposed to behave or how they're um, supposed to act or manifest these different things. So yeah, I 100% I agree, which makes sense because we're co-authors <laughs> on, <laughs> on those papers. Um, how do you see kind of the field around personality evolving in medical education as a whole? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think, again, the, the personality piece is interesting, um, particularly as we think about teams. Uh, I think that, um, you know, if there were easier ways uh, to kind of dig into the different personality types and then almost blend a variety of those individuals together on a team um, that you would get a lot of um, potentially more interesting interactions with how those different individuals are coming, coming at or trying to think about a problem and find solutions. Um, and so I think of, you know, personality assessment still being kind of very valuable, not like, like you were saying, not to put somebody in a box, but to kind of understand that we, there are so many of us in all these different boxes, but when you kind of like bring us together, then we can try to piece together and create a whole from that. Um, and so I think that it's valuable because certainly if you have somebody that is, you know, more outspoken and can kind of shape the team and how they're interacting in one way, but then if you know that somebody might not be quite as outspoken and may need a little bit more time to kind of process and bring their information to the team, understanding uh, kind of the behavioral outputs of those different personalities can really help make your team better as opposed to thinking that, you know, somebody that's not talking is because they have no clue what's going on. Instead, they're, you know, processing it, processing it in their own way. And so I think that, um, you know, personally, I am pretty extroverted. And so I have no problem in <laughs> engaging from that standpoint. But um, I think that uh, there's a smaller segment of the population that is introverted. And I think many times those individuals sometimes kind of get get boxed out of uh, some of the discussions because perhaps they're not 
quite as ready to formulate and discuss their points. And so I think having a broader understanding of, of that variation and then thinking how to kind of build teams around that, uh, it can be really valuable and is something that we haven't necessarily really kind of done to maybe its full extent in medicine. Yeah, absolutely. And that reminds me of, you know, something one of my friends recently did and was gracious enough to share with me because I was curious, but he basically constructed a book that was like his as well as his family's history. And I'm trying to do something similar, although it is not going so well (laughs) at the moment um, for my family. And, but, and, you know, I, he told me that he had finished it. And so I asked him like, oh, can I read it? You know, cause I'm always curious to learn more about the people that I care about in my life. And so he sent it to me and after reading it, like, so like, I had so much more insight into, you know, him as an individual and how he communicates and what he values and what's important. And I was like, man, if I just had this for every important person in my life, and if we all did, you know, think, think how much better we'd all be able to relate to one another by having that understanding. And so, yeah, perhaps personality assessments or other, you know, these targeted assessments are a way to quickly get that information, particularly in an occupational context where we can use some of it in a way that's meaningful to construct those better teams that you're talking about. And so speaking of teams, we all know that residency training is a team sport as much as it is also an individual exercise for those that are in training. Let's talk a little bit about the match. Um, ENT has been notorious in a variety of different ways, <laughs> depending on the year for what has occurred in our match. And this year we had another I'll just say ridiculous year in terms of, you know, the number of overall applicants and and folks going unmatched and a lot of uncertainty. And then to add on top of that, you know, research fellowship years were not allowed to recruit during the SOAP week because that was a match violation. So it added additional uncertainty to the applicants who are trying to decide, you know, do I SOAP or scramble into something? Do I do a research year? All the risk is on me. What do I do? Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, you know, where, where we've been recently slash where we are now and, you know, how you see things evolving. Yeah, I, I think in many ways, like you said, we've kind of gone up and down <laughs> in terms of our numbers, um, but certainly more recently, the, those numbers have been quite high and, and I think that's probably a trend that will likely continue. If you look at the match as a whole, um, the number of applicants compared to uh, res- or compared to available s- residency slots um, has really just kind of grown astronomically. And much of that has to do with the fact that um, there are certainly a large number of medical schools uh, that have opened up, as well as have increased their class sizes over the past um, many years uh, without a concomitant increase in the GME slots. And so um, as a whole, there was t- there were about 10,000 more applicants this year than residency slots. Um, and so whether it's otolaryngology or any of the various specialties, there were certainly, and kind of unfortunately, a lot of unmatched applicants. Um, of course, then when you think about that, there's certainly going to be a subset of them that then try to apply next year. And so it's just going to be almost this kind of vicious cycle of there's more and more as we keep compounding this to, to some extent. Um, there, there have been a couple bills that have been put through uh, to Congress to actually increase the GME slots. Um, in fact, one that was put through recently is to increase the amount of slots, I want to say it by 14,000 over the next seven years. So, um, so there should be, ideally, as long as things go through, um, more, more slots that are available for that, the number of applicants that are out there. Um, you know, I think um, in terms of otolaryngology, you know, it, it certainly continues to be pretty competitive. Generally speaking, it's US MD seniors that tend to take up the large majority of our slots um, in terms of matching uh, for otolaryngology. Uh, and, you know, I think that there certainly are have been a lot of discussions as to 
um, our residency selection kind of process and what what measures um, and filters and screening practices are out there um, in terms of how we select uh, our future residents kind of across the board from a national perspective. Um, and I, I think that um, certainly as we look to the near future, uh, USMLE is going to be switching from a score to pass fail. Um, and so that's a big, big kind of discussion point. Um, and then, uh, you know, in the past year or so, we've had the combination of the ACGME and the AAOA kind of combining. So it's a combined resident combined residency selection match process now. Um, so that's also kind of changed and fluctuated our historical numbers to be able to look at things. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I think that I actually have enjoyed your work um, that you guys <laughs> did uh, at Kansas and, and you've talked about in terms about, in terms of the, it's the star, correct? Am I mm -hmm. saying that right? The star. And so how do we, how do we think about looking kind of more broadly at all of the different components of the application um, and really being able to kind of pull out and highlight aspects that maybe don't use some of the more objective kind of standards as much upfront um, as, as that can put us at risk to not having potentially as much diversity in a variety of ways that we kind of look at diversity um, and one thing that we know in otolaryngology is that certainly uh, when it comes to diversity and particularly around race, racial and ethnic diversity, um, we tend to be one of the fields that has the least um, in, in, by the numbers. So I think that these are, these are all things that uh, are being looked at a, a lot now lately um, and are probably going to come up even more so kind of over the next, uh, next few match cycles and everything as we kind of bring these discussions forward around those topics. Yeah, I think if nothing else, you know, the 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 way that the match has been evolving ha is really forcing us to have conversations that we probably should have had a long time ago in terms of what are the there's not going to be a best method, but what are some best practices, you know, to try to continue to preserve the high quality nature of the candidates that we select without unfairly disadvantaging people. And, you know, along those same lines and you know, especially having heard your story about having to wait, you know, until a, until a peed spot was going to be open. So you could pursue that sort of training. Unfortunately, the reality is that otolaryngology as a field is amazing, as we know, but it also makes it one of the reasons why it's so highly competitive. And one of the, the ways I think that we struggle in a way that perhaps can't be fixed, but is how do we, how do we make a system that's fair and equitable and everybody can walk away feeling good when at the end of the day, we also know that we just do not have enough slots, period, for the number of applicants, nor you know, can the health system as a whole support a system in which you, know, you have more subspecialists than you know, general practitioners. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it, the entire process is kind of tricky when you look at it as well from the standpoint of, you know, we, there's so many areas of the country. I mean, in terms of as we, you know, select from when we're looking at kind of rural areas, like it, it, it's hard to, as you're looking at picking somebody, um, we know that our lives change a lot, our desires change a lot across the process. And so even when we're kind of picking individuals, you know, you may not know where they want to go practice or they may get impassioned by something else. And so to try to really be able to disperse um, the serving population of <laughs> surgeons in the right way when we select them up front is really difficult. Um, and so I think that that also plays into the process a little bit because you know, we don't have a crystal ball for what's going to happen five, six, seven, eight years down the road. Um, and, and nobody does. And so I think that certainly we have projections on how we're going to be down so many general practitioners and down so many subspecialists by this time point. Um, but we know that 
also populations are changing where people live are changing. There's concentrations in certain areas. And so trying to really fine tune that answer is not easy. I think the other component is, is, you know, there's a certainly a lot of people that are interested in probably helping others, uh, which is what probably brings a lot of us to medical school. Um, and I think that uh, there probably needs to be better ways to, one, address the fact that many of these students, I feel like, go to medical school and really don't understand when they're going to medical school, potentially how in some cases, like dire the match rate might be, um, you know, may, maybe, maybe they do understand, but I think that, um, you know, some of the asymmetries of the number of slots versus the number of residency slots, when you look at kind of medical school to residency, um, it might not be that well known that when you come out on the other side, it, you might be staring at a pretty difficult uh, barrier to actually get a residency slot. Um, and so how do we kind of not lose those individuals that are passionate about helping in medicine um, and could also reinforce the system in other places, whether it be kind of masters in public health and kind of doing work from a social determinants of health standpoint, or absolutely technology is exploding. And how do we potentially match people up with industry? Because industry does not know how to work with the end user for what they need, but potentially working with people that have gone to medical school um, might be able to give some of that insight. Um, or how do we even kind of develop, you know, programs similar to, uh, you know, within the military, um, we have a number of individuals that go and essentially kind of do um, their initial kind of PGY one kind of training year and become general medical officers and actually serve as essentially kind of the family practice physicians for um, military units. And so how do we potentially get individuals to have that kind of initial year of training become um, licensed practitioners and still be able to serve some of these remote communities and, and provide um, touch points for them on a more local level um, to enhance kind of health kind of in that more broader dispersed nature. So I think that there's a lot of opportunities to still not lose some of these interested individuals and potentially even talk about some of these avenues and pathways and support programs for them um, more so. Um, Granted, maybe these exist already, and I am just a little bit clueless because I haven't been around medical schools in a really long time. Um, but I think that um, especially as um, we still have, you know, thousands and thousands of these medical students that are that are finishing that, um, you know, are searching for some some place to find some meaning in their life, even if it's just for a year and then they go on to match. But, um, but I think that there's a, a population out there that you can see is in some ways kind of hurting <laughs> um, when you, when you especially look at so social media um, during match week and after match week. Um, it seems like there's a lot of disheartened people out there um, that definitely want to care for others. So I think uh, it, it's hopeful and also sometimes maybe a little disheartening and trying to figure out uh, where, where to help them. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, just watching all the social media stuff come across my feed, it has been soul crushing. <laughs> As a spectator, you know, I can't imagine what it what it's like for the students that are experiencing it. But I think that you make a, I think you make an excellent point in that we tend to really get very focused on what we think the one end point should be, you know, in a way that doesn't necessarily allow us to explore other avenues, which is compounded by the fact that those other avenues are like not presented to us, you know, during the course of our training, like medical schools are not like, yes, let's give you all of these, this tool, these tools and knowledge so that you can go apply it to industry. You know, it's like the foregone conclusion is that your career will be in clinical medicine, but you're exactly right that as people grow and evolve their interests and skill sets do as well. And for some of us, that is not a majority, you know, of clinical medicine. Like I myself right now, I'm 60% research. I never thought that those sorts of words would come out of my mouth, certainly not when I was a student or a resident, but, you know, things change. Yep. I, 
as I kind of, I think that's essentially where I started out this podcast was I have kind of dabbled in many different things along the way. And they've, some have been a dead end and others have introduced me to other opportunities or, or other interests or other questions that have led me down other paths. I mean, I think that in some ways my, um, my interest in kind of quality improvement and patient safety um, led me in many ways to a lot of the work around how, who gets to access medicine, who gets to be a physician, who gets to be a surgeon. um, And also in many ways too, a lot of the work around kind of diversity and some of these discussions that we've been talking about teamwork and, and how do you bring together a diverse team from multiple perspectives um, in order to ideally kind of get to kind of the best result possible. And so, um, so again, kind of the quality work kind of dovetailed into the diversity work dovetailed into the residency selection work. And so it's just been kind of a snowballing path in a way. Um, but it's, you know, been exciting the whole time. (laughs) Awesome. Well, that I think brings us to the end of our time. I mean, if you have any other concluding thoughts, feel free to offer them now. Uh, no, I just, uh, thank you for, uh, letting me chat. I uh, have enjoyed, uh, listening to, many of the other women in otolaryngology that have come along and learned about tidbits of advice uh, from their own pathways. So uh, I think that it's nice to kind of get lessons, lessons learned from the front lines. Um, So I've enjoyed it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I, I would like to reflect that back at you and say, thank you so much for your time and energy. I know you've got a lot going on. And so I certainly appreciate it. And I know our listeners do too. Thank you for listening. We are always striving to improve and committed to bringing you the content you want and need. If you have any specific feedback, suggestions, or concerns, please email us at prescription, that's rx.fierce, at gmail.com, or reach us on our Twitter page at prescriptionfierce, that's at rx.fierce. Special thanks, as always, to the Women in Otolaryngology Endowment Grant, as well as to our wonderful producer, Dr. Hannah Kavukshin.